I posted the source sheet in the chat. We're also live streaming now. So we will get started. Okay, today's, uh, today's topic you may not think is so relevant. Certainly it's not relevant to all the Jewish community or most of the Jewish community, practically speaking, in terms of the topic to be discussed. But I would submit to you that it's, it's really important as we think about the diversity of the Jewish community and trying to be an inclusive Jewish community, what emerges from this discussion is really this debate that existed between um, uh, Rav, Rav Moshe Feinstein and Rav Yaakov Breisch concerning the issue of guide dogs, seeing eye dogs for the blind. Can you bring a seeing eye dog in, into shul? Now, obviously you would not think like, you know, take away the service animal portion of it. Can you bring a dog to shul? For sure not, you can't bring a dog to shul, right? It can be disruptive, even if it's a very quiet dog. Um, you know, other people will talk about it. It'll create a scene. People will be uh, dis, um, distracted. Certainly kids will be distracted, right? So we can understand why there might be a no dogs allowed policy um, in, um, in, in, in a shul. Well, you're not, you're, not, you're, you're, not, you're not supposed to dive in somewhere where you are distracted and you're not supposed to distract other people. So it definitely borders on when it's expansive. Now, again, they wouldn't, the reason why you're saying it's halacha is because no one fathomed bringing dogs to shul. So you're not going to find a simon in Shulchan Arach that tells you you can't bring a dog to shul. What you find in Shulchan Arach is if you have a dog that's a guard dog, make sure to tie it up. Because that's the dog, that's the pet you had, uh, a pet that was uh, meant to be security. You know, you could have named it ADT or some Brinks, right? That's, that's the kind of dog you had, right? So the fact that we can't find a simon and sif. But we know that you're not that 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 in shul, um, synagogue is shared space, and as shared space, we have to be uh, on our best behavior one and um, facilitate others uh, to uh, to have a meaningful communal prayer experience. Well, you're saying, yeah, like, it was, it was into shul, right? Right. Although we're going to talk about food in shul and in a base medrash, and you know what what they dealt with, right? But right, the halacha doesn't deal with. Um, you could some, sometimes extrapolate and sometimes apply the values that we know from other situations to update them to modern day uh, modern day scenario. So we're not. We, we shouldn't be doing things that are distracting to others uh, in in shul. It's shared space. And therefore, we have to uh, be cognizant of our surroundings and try to do th- and try to ensure that everybody feels comfortable. What about what about a, a service dog? What about let, let's let's deal only with um, seeing eye dogs. Um, once you get into uh, what constitutes a service dog in some of your buildings that you live in, or used to live in, or, or other people live in, right? Like we're, we're talking about for real. Not what gets to the, through the condo, board, okay? <laughs> or what, what 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 gets on what used to get on uh, airplanes, right? We're not that's not we're not talking about that, right? There, it used to be like you online you can register to become a uh, clergy to marry people, and online you can register your pet to be a, to be a service animal. Or it used to be that way. Now it's a little bit more. The, the airlines caught on, and now it's more complicated. So let's talk about for real, not what the world defines as perhaps a service animal. And let's, let's deal with it as it was dealt with in uh, 1953, right? Chav Gimel maybe it was winter of 1954, uh, in a tshuva that Rav Moshe Feinstein sent to uh, Rav Pinchas uh, Mordechai Teitz, uh, the uh, chief rabbi of Elizabeth, New Jersey, hometown of 
my wife, Rebecca. So this, this question was asked. It was a real question asked by Rev Tights to Rev Moshe Feinstein. And, and it's presented in the first piece we're going to look at. Last time we didn't look at a tshuva as much. I felt bad. I want, to, I want to look at the tshuvas and read them with you and learn them with you together. And what I did was instead of quoting the tshuva verbatim, what I did was I quoted key passages and then went and quoted the original text that Rav Moshe uses and alludes to and refers to in his, um, in his response on that allows us to add some uh, original, uh, you know, um, uh, primary text, but also allows me to translate them because they're in the, the English in, in a number of places that I was able to um, gather for you on the source sheet. So the question is, meaning Suma Shergilu Kalev the Holicho, uh, a, a, a blind person who is accustomed to have a dog accompany him wherever he goes. In Yachali Kalev Is he allowed to enter a shul? Litzvila. This is from my friend, the Av uh, Bezdin, the head of Elizabeth. This is a bet. Um, so a third line in the Hebrew. Right? A, a blind person who has taught, or they taught, right? You, they go to they go to they go to guide school. To teach the uh, to teach the dog to accompany the blind person, right? The dog has to always be with with the uh, with his with the, with, with the human, with the blind person. Uh, this is especially true during the training period, and it's really true at, at, at early for for a long period of time. The dog needs to be with the human, and after that, the human is so used to it, the human wants to always be with the dog. So Ramosha takes that as a given. You can't just, you know, park your dog at the door like you might be asked to do with other types of, um, of, of, of items of, or, or, or things that could be, that are potentially disruptive, right? Can he come to Shul to pray with a minion? Kadish, Kedusha, Kriyata Torah, Kriyata Megillah. There are lots of things you can, you, you know, one might suggest, oh, just um, just just daven at home, right? You know, it's um, it's 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 rare in history that shul rabbis are called upon to tell their congregants you should daven at home and it's okay. I, for whatever reason, has been one of those lucky rabbis that during my career have told people to stay home. But we know that we miss a lot when we're home, when we don't have the opportunity. Yes, for all the reasons we might be thinking of, and for the halachic reasons, Kaddish and Kedusha and reading the Torah and all the parts of davening that you can't do to their fullest extent in the absence of a tzibor, in the absence of a minion, right? Um, right, so Ramosha first gives a number of reasons why even in the question, right? He presents it as, these are, there's a number of reasons why we should be lenient, right? One of them is that the animal, the, the, the person can't come to shul without it. And, um, uh, and, 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 but on the other hand, it's an animal and our synagogues are mikdash ma'at. Were dogs allowed in the temple, the Beit HaMikdash? No, well, most probably not. Rabbi Menachem Kasher, says that there's a, there's, a, there's a biblical prohibition in the Torah that a carbon cannot be brought from the funds that were, used, that, that were gained by selling a dog. It's called Mechir Kelly. So Rebbe Kasher says, if you're not allowed to bring a carbon that has this indirect relationship with an animal, then of course you can't bring an animal, a dog into the temple, right? Interesting, people reject that logic. But it was sort of a given that you're not you're not under normal circumstances you're not bringing pets or animals except to slaughter them right those are right well, animal sacrifice existed in the temple but other than that you're not bringing or you're not bringing animals so maybe our synagogues are mikdash ma'at a miniature temple beta mikdash and therefore it should be prohibited so Moshe points to a Tommy Jerusalem to make his point. He says, and the Tom Yerushalmi is given it in the English, it was stated, one may not behave unbecomingly in a synagogue or house of study. One neither eats nor drinks in them, nor takes walks in them, nor sleeps in them, nor enters into them because of the sun in the summer, right? To get out of the heat or because of the rain in the winter, you don't use a synagogue as a, uh, as a, as a, as a 
respite from the weather, right? Maybe it's a spiritual refuge, but not for the weather. That's the only reason why you're going in. But when studies and preaches in them, right? You pray, you learn, you discuss Torah. Then Rabbi Ami, Rabbi Ibi commanded the teachers. See, this seems to be a difference of opinion to what was just said. If a person comes to you who is dirtied by study, accept him and his donkey and his implements. In other words, there's this idea that understood most people understand, their emotion understands this to mean that according to Ravami, you're allowed to bring your work animal, your beast of burden, your donkey into the base medrash. Right? You're allowed to bring it in. It, Ravami says if somebody's somebody's engaged in, in, in learning and engaged in their work, you can bring them in with all of the accompaniments, the accoutrements of work, even, even, their, even, their, uh, even their beast of, uh, of labor. How does this work? In other words, the first statement of the Josefta seems to be unequivocal. You're not allowed to treat the study halls and the, and the synagogues in any way that we would consider to be disrespectful. Comes along Rabbi Ami and, and, and suggests something contrary to that original statement. Um, so the, for this, we look at the Babylonian Talmud, Bavli, also tracked in Megillah around the same area where I gave you the Hebrew, but we'll read it in the English. One may not adorn oneself inside them. What does that mean? The prohibition applies only to lay people, but Torah scholars and their disciples are permitted to do so. Ein bahen, the idea is, is that one shouldn't um, be engaged in other activities other than learning and, and praying and teaching and preaching. However, there's this exception, Torah scholars and their disciples are permitted to do so. As Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, what is the meaning of the term? Bay, right? The, the study halls were called Bay Rabbana, right? Which is used to describe a study hall. It's a shortened form of Beta de Rabbana, the home, the house of the sages. And as explained here, in order to facilitate the consistent presence of the Torah scholars, in the study hall, it is permitted for them to use the hall as though it was their home, right? So in other words, even though ideally there is, uh, we are supposed to have this decorum, this reverence for a study hall, nonetheless, practically speaking, um, there were some, there was latitude and leeway and leniencies um, uh, allowed for other types of activities not directly related to teaching and preaching and praying to occur in a Beit Midrash. So if you bring this to from the Talmud to the codes, there's a small piece that I gave you from the Magen Avram, commentary on the Shulchan Aruch in, um, in chapter 151, third source from the bottom, it's therefore permitted to eat and drink in a study hall, because if every time they needed a sip of water, right, they're, they're talking, they're, they're disagreeing with each other, they're teaching, their mouths get parched, their throats get dry. You require them to leave the Beit Midrash every time you needed a drink, and there was no water fountains back then, right? They might have to go all the way home, right, in order to get their drink. Then you would be wasting a tremendous amount of time. And therefore, the Magen Avram says, Right? Avalim ein lom dim bebeit haknesset, asurin lechob lishtot shom. Right? Da'atu tamir chacham yin emuzar al mora hamikdash. So what's very interesting is that whereas the Talmud, when it's talking about the honor and reverence due to these locations, includes both a study hall and a synagogue in one fell swoop. Both of them are deserving of honor and respect, and all of these other activities are prohibited. However, you come to the codes as they distill these ideas, especially with the examples that are given where the study hall is called the home of the rabbis. At home, you'll have a snack, you'll have something to eat, which opens the possibility that these locations are permitted for these types of activities, not activities beyond the rituals of learning and teaching and preaching and praying. So we have the possibility of seeing it as distinct. That maybe the base measurish, maybe the place where you're studying, you should be allowed to have other activities. But the Beit Knesset, where all you're doing is praying, right? And it's not typical, regardless of 
what, what some people, what you'll see, right? If you survey people in general, do you, is, is a synagogue a location for eating and drinking, right? The majority of people would say no. The vast majority would say no. Every once in a while you see someone, the vast majority of people would say no. So therefore there would be less, uh, there, there might be less leeway uh, in, that, um, in that situation. Why is it okay? What, what happened? Why is there a difference between what the Yerushalmi talks about uh, uh, that, that is unequivocal at first, and then we have some of these um, leniencies and carve outs and exceptions that would allow for eating and drinking. So for that, we look at the continuation of the Talmud Bavli, the last English source on side one, where Avasi said synagogues in Babylonia are built from the outset with a stipulation, al tanai heim nivnu. They're built with, on, on condition. What's that condition? That they not have the full sanctity of a mikdash ma'at. That is to say, without, without any clarification, we should assume that a synagogue has the status of a mikdash ma'at, a miniature temple. And just as in the temple, no eating, no drinking, no dogs, no anything, nothing except for that which is directly related to the ritual at hand, so too synagogues as well. However, synagogues in the diaspora were built, were understood to be built, whether explicitly or implicitly, for other services, as not merely a location of prayer, but as a location of gathering, as a location of socializing, as a location of pizza eating, all of these things. How, how can you do any of that in any of this building? This is all a synagogue. No, al tanai heim nivnim bonim. They're built al tanai with some. Uh, we, uh, on the condition that they will, that we're allowed to use the latitude and leniencies already found in the Talmud for all of our locations. That's not to say that all bets are off, right? It still retains its sanctity, but there is leeway to, for, for activities that we might otherwise have thought are completely banned or barred. They, they, they can find some expression. So going taking all this into consideration, we look at uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, how he, how he takes, takes these ideas. On the one hand, you know, a, a dog seems out of place within a, a synagogue. On the other hand, there seems to be some permission, especially in synagogues that are built out tonight with a condition that other activities would be allowed. So where, where, where is Rav Moshe going to take us? Where's Rabbi Feinstein going to, um, uh, uh, which, which idea is he going to emphasize more when he, when he deals with this particular case with real people's lives um, affected. So the, the, the uh, problem says synagogues are dead well yet. And you said in the diaspora, is that, is, is there any different in Israel? So in Israel, there, there, there might be, there might be um, whether or not, practically speaking, it may come up the question is asked by the post game is a, is a synagogue in Eretz Israel assumed to be built out tonight? Can you have, or does it have to be explicitly built out tonight? Because the Kedusha, just to get a little technical, the Kedusha of a Mikdash Ma'at, of a base Knesset in Israel is understood to be perhaps Medivre Sofrim, right? right? As a, a more direct uh, connection between the temple and, and the synagogue. Whereas in, Eretz, whereas in the Chutz Laaretz and the diaspora, it's viewed to be Midrabana. Therefore, when you're dealing within the realm of sanctity that was applied by the rabbis, there's more latitude to say, when we say, hey, Mamru, hey, Mamru. They're the ones that said that we should apply this rule that really applies in Israel to the diaspora. And therefore, they could say it, only, it doesn't apply to all activities. It, it only applies to those activities um, which would be viewed as uh, irreverent uh, by the Talmud. Because the Talmud has these areas of gray where they say, you know, really, you shouldn't be doing it, but maybe you could do it. And if there's a tanai that it could be allowed, so in the Futzlar, it's because Kedusha space like Nessus the Rabbanon, we say that uh, we apply the, those leniencies. Now it's Israel, can you not apply them at all? Or do you have to explicitly do it at the state that you want these leniencies to apply? I think it's a matter of some uh, discussion. So, so let's, let, let, let's, let's the, the summation, the, the crux of what Rabbi Feinstein provides for us is in the last, uh, last, last source in Hebrew. I'll read it and translate it as I go along. You're welcome to follow inside or just to listen.
Therefore, Kevin de Beha de Behach Nasat Chamor, Chazina Shalom Garam Echilo Shtia. The way Rabbi Feinstein understands it is that this idea of bringing that donkey into the uh, base measureish is on par with eating and drinking. He says both of these are things that under normal circumstances we would consider to be irreverent. And yet there is some mention of the possibility of it being allowed, right? Um, Vashina and, and napping. Right, therefore, our synagogues in the he's dealing with Elizabeth, New Jersey, since they are assumed or even explicitly created to, in, to be allowed to be used for these other gray area activities, he says, well, if they're allowed to be used for gray area activities like eating and drinking, and that Tommy Yerushalmi mentions the bringing in of an animal a lot in the same sentence, in the same, in the same uh, piece of uh, same teaching. So therefore, it can be, we, we can permit it, provided that, end of the first line, imhu bishat hatcha. Right, this is an urgent, there's no way to get around it. Right, shas hatchak, right, it's kibidiyavidami, if, if you know, Ramosha is saying, listen, if we could, if we could avoid it, if it's not really a, a necessity, um, then we should avoid it. But if it's shat hatchak, there's no way to get around it. It's, there's a pressing matter. It's an urgent matter for this person. Then, um, then we'll allow it based on the Ushalmi and based on the understanding that diaspora synagogues are built with on condition to be used for these gray areas and activity. Now, for me, what's precedent setting is the usage of shat hatchak in this case. Because what could you have said what you could have said is that it's really unfortunate that this person can't come to shul. But he can't come to shul. He can't come to shul, he can't come to shul. Right? I spent a year telling people, if you can't come to shul, you can't come to shul. Right? And, 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 and it's okay. You're missing out on, we, we get it, you're missing out on things. But if the only way for you, individual, to come to shul and participate in all those great things that are praying with a community, is that we have to allow you to come with a dog and then maybe you should say it. I'm really sorry, but you can't come, right? Why is it shat hatchak? Why is it shat hatchak for me if he can't come to shul, right? But that, but Ramosha says it is, right? So in some way we are impinging upon the entire community. So, right, and, and, and what may, some may argue that we are impinging upon what would ideally would be the sanctity and the reverence and the practice of the synagogue so that this individual has the ability to come to shore. Right. Right. Yeah, so that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And they're saying that since it was built, it was built, but... But, but that, that doesn't seem to be enough. It has to be on condition. And it doesn't seem to be, even Rabbi Feinstein is saying, we may not generally, even if we would never allow the donkey to come in, right? Under normal circumstances, he would allow for the guide dog because it's shat hachat. There's no other way to get around it. Um, uh, Right, a course of Mishnah Berurah. Second line after the comma, Mavada Shekela Logar Mechamor. Right, certainly a dog is no worse than a than a, than a donkey, like Beth Ann said. Veinalanu Shat Hachak Gadol Mizeh. This is what I think. Uh, this is what I think is really, to me, the most precedent setting, the, the the really critical idea that that this is an urgent matter. We consider this to be Shat Hachak Shimlo Nitarnu. If we do not permit this person to come with his guide dog, it but they'll call him up it's feel a bit seaboard. He would never be allowed to join the congregation in prayer, neither for Torah reading or Megillah reading, neither for and and um neither for the Yamim Norayim. And as as Ramosha says here, Yesh Yamim Sheha Agmat Nefesh, Kidoloma Od. There'd be days in which the sorrow that this person would feel for not being able to come to shul, can't come to shul in Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Yeah, well, we know what that feels like. But yeah, like, that's what we, people know what that feels like. But yeah, but Ramosha says, no, that's reason enough 
to ask to, to, to permit something that under normal circumstances we may not, right? Um, right? The, 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 one, the one concession he makes to the, to, the, to the distraction that this may cause is the last words on the first page. Sit near, the, sit near the entrance, right? Don't walk all the way to the other side of the shul, right? We'll make a big deal. Walk, walk in, get to where you need to sit and sit, uh, try to be as, uh, as inconspicuous as, uh, as possible. But even if it won't be, even if there will, even if it will be somewhat conspicuous, Ramosha is saying that it's okay. That's a shat hadcha. And because otherwise this person, what, you're gonna tell this person never to daven with the tzibor? So I might have thought, yeah. You know, tough luck. Uh, I guess I'm not as sensitive as Ramosha Feinstein is, right? Because he says, you know, this is this is a reason to be this is a reason to be lenient. Turn over the page, and on this side, I, I don't have any of the. Uh, I'm just going to sort of paraphrase. And Yaakov Reich, Rav Yaakov Reich uh, grew up in, um, in Lithuania. He was born at the end of the 19th century, and um, due due to the during in the years leading up, he was a rav in, in Germany. Leading up to the Holocaust, he moved to France and was able, before the onslaught of the Nazis, to make it to Zurich, where he was a, 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 a one of the very few um, post-Gim halachic deciders in post-war Europe. In other words, if you look at the responsive literature of post of uh, in the post-war era, there's really only two names that come to mind: Rav Yaakov Breisch of the Feltes Yaakov. And Rav Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, the Swedish. Those are the only two rabbis who were in Europe post uh, post Holocaust uh, about what 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 was what was lost. Um, so Rav Yaakov Breish disagrees with Ramosha, and he starts right at the stop by saying, "To look at the second line of the Hebrew, Hasagot Al Pisco Digrot Moshe." These are my you know, the the Ram the the Riven has notes on the Rambam's Mishnah Torah that he calls Hasagot, it's where he disagrees with the Rambam. This tshuva is, is referred to as Hasago, my disagreement with Ramosha Feinstein about this topic, about this particular responsum, about the permission, the permissibility of bringing a seeing eye dog into the synagogue, right? And obviously Rabbi Reich is against it. And he brings up a couple of reasons, right? He's, he, he, he points out that he feels that were Moshe Feinstein, and they were contemporaries. They were contemporaries. Rabbi Breish died in 1976, or Moshe died in 1986, but they were basically contemporaries, or Moshe was a little bit older, I believe. So we see here, Rabbi Breish says that Rabbi Moshe has built this theory, the basis, the justification for his leniency, live not me gadol ad yisod re'ua kazet. He's building this great leniency on very shaky ground, right? That's what Rabbi Breish says. Why does he have a problem with it? Because he says um, that this whole, what Rabbi Feinstein wants to do is gloss over the difference between a study hall and a synagogue, right? Right? We, we, we group them together, right? At first, when we want reverence, when the Talmud, the Yushami tells us to have reverence, we want reverence for both. And then the example given is a base medrash where there were some leniencies. And Ramosha says, oh, there's leniencies. So there's leniencies for a study hall, there's leniencies for a synagogue because both can be built al Tanai. Rabbi Frank says, is that really intellectually honest? Is there no difference between a study hall and a synagogue? You know, anyway, and, 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 and he, 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 he wants to suggest that there is a fundamental difference between the two, right? And the only reason that you can blur the line between the two, says uh, Rabbi Breish, is in a situation where the, where the synagogue was used like a study. Right? Where the synagogue, where the, the location of prayer was also the location of study. Now, again, what does this mean? That there's a Dvar Torah at the Minyan, that there's a shir between Mincha and Marav, or that there's learning that goes on there on a regular basis? I think there's room for discussion. What I would suggest to you is that if you want, if you want there to be a difference between a base measure and a synagogue, you're going to find there to be a difference, and that's that's what Rabbi Breish does. Whereas Rabbi Feinstein wants to say, no, they're the same. 
and it was permitted for the donkey to come to the Bidrash, that it's permissible for the seeing eye dog to come to the synagogue, right? So in, in some ways, the way you interpret um, ambiguous texts are read through the lens of what you feel is the ultimate value and the ultimate destination that you're getting to, right? Rabbi Bryce says, no, you, dogs can't come into Shul. I, there's a donkey going into the Beit Midrash. That's different. And Moshe said, no, they're the same. There's no difference between the two. If you can, if, you, if, if it's permissible in the, in the house of study, then it's, then it's permissible in the synagogue um, as well. And, but Rabbi Bryce says that, that, that are we saying that he, he takes it the next step. He says, are you really saying that because we want scholars and people who are learning Torah not to have to leave for lunch, are you really saying that, that all bets are off, that they can act that way in a location that's primarily used for prayer? Does that make sense? Are you saying that Talmide Chachamim, those who are engaged in the study of Torah on a regular basis, don't have an obligation to, obligation to revere the synagogue? That they can just treat it, you know, in, in, a, similar, in a similar way as the latitude we give for, uh, for eating and drinking so that they don't have to get up every time they need a, they need a sip or a snack? He says that's not really that doesn't that doesn't ring true, and that that's a bad way of uh, viewing it. It negates, it diminishes the sanctity that we should have for the synagogue. And he wants to draw a distinction. Whatever we said about a house of study may apply, but it certainly doesn't extend to a, a synagogue. If anything, those who are more engrossed and engaged in Torah study should be more sensitive to the sanctity that exists within a synagogue, and therefore more of a reason. There doesn't seem to be a, a permissibility of, um, of, of, of allowing dogs, animals into the synagogue. One other point that Rabbi Feinstein is making, and this is also an interesting point, all, who, who's given permission to, 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 to do certain things in the study hall that, that technically are prohibited? Talmidei Chacham. Who's Rabbi Moshe talking about? A regular Jew. Is he a Talmud Chacham? Maybe, maybe not, right? So another thing that Rabbi Feinstein does is he extends the permission that was given spe seemingly specifically to a, a group within the Jewish people and applies it more broadly when the need arises. Specifically because he's not a Talmud Chacham, this person, but he's, he's blind. He needs, a, he needs the guide to it. So it doesn't have, you know, he may not have the latitude of, you know, having his snack in the base medrash, where Moshe is going to use that logic to allow him to bring his guide dog into, uh, into the shul, right? But, but Rabbi Bryce says, is this, does this ring true? Can we distinguish between what we might have allowed some people to do in a study hall versus what the expectation and the permission, permissions and the leniencies of a, of a, of a, of a Beit Knesset, of a, of a synagogue? Furthermore, Rabbi Bryce says, what are, these, what are these permissions? The permission to eat and drink, permission to bring things in, that's at a time when prayer or study is not taking place. But while it's going on, right, we, we started, it's shared space. It's, it can be very distracting if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's a service animal that walks into the, walks into the synagogue, right? I can't think of anything that would be more distracting than a donkey or a dog walking into walking into a uh, walking into the walking into a shul. And again, we're not talking about before davening or after davening or in between, in the middle of davening, right? What 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 might Rabbi Feinstein say to that? Because if you don't let people in, especially someone like that, 
you are divorcing him from Jewish communal religious life. Beautiful, right? Right. So that's what Rabbi Feinstein's saying. And I, I, just to just to buttress and to support what Cindy's saying, if you look at the second to last sort of paragraph, that one liner towards the end of uh, towards the end of the quotes from the Chalkas Yaakov, the Ikar. This is Rabbi Bryce says, you know, you know what really my problem is. This is really my problem. It's not Jewish. It's have dogs, right? That's what he said. That's the basis of it, right? In other words, it's it's not, right? So again, you could ask, it would seem to be that if that, it, you could ask, Rabbi Bresh, is this a halacha lo moshe misinai, right? That Jews and dogs don't go together? Or is that just the reality as you've experienced it, right? I would, I would venture the second, the latter. In other words, there's nothing halacha, there's nothing intrinsic within the Jewish tradition that it has to be. But Rabbi Breish was so uh, entrenched in this uh, in this view that he says it's it's incredibly distracting. Nobody can even imagine uh, a guide dog, and it would completely uh, you know completely disturb the sanctity of the service. And from that perspective, he's not willing to. Uh, so I definitely think that you're looking at it from across you know the opposite sides of the Atlantic. And, and 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 different communities and different expectations and different uh, norms. Yeah, Mark. Uh, I have two thoughts. One was uh, was Rabbi Feinstein actually faced with a person who wanted to bring a dog and Rabbi Bryce not. Okay, that's true. In other words, Rabbi Bryce is, is responding to Rabbi Feinstein in the abstract. And Rabbi Feinstein, although not although he was not he was presented with a real person, right? Rabbi Tights told him about a real person. That really that wanted to go to shul and couldn't because of this. So yeah, there's also the, the theoretical versus the reality. So the, the second thing, not that I would want this point to win, but aren't blind people exempt from the toe or certain toe? Uh, so that's um, he doesn't mention that because um, actually, if you want to listen to my this week in Mishnah Yomi, it actually talks about blind people because that was one of the topics in Mishnah Yomi. It's on YouTube on the shul YouTube channel. But the, the upshot is, is that um, we hold that uh, blind people are obligated in its vote, that they would be, uh, that they're obligated in prayer, that a blind person can serve as a shliat tzibor, as a chazan. The only thing a blind person cannot serve as is a balkore, because you have to read it from the text. But otherwise, otherwise they're full, full-fledged Jews. Now, again, if they're blind and they can't get to shul, then they're exempt from coming to shul, right? That's sort of the We've all, we all got familiar with that in the COVID era, right? Going to shul is what you should do, but if you can't, you don't. And you're, you know, and, 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 and you're called what you're, you're what's called an ones, you're under duress, you don't have a choice. So again, using that, I, I, I would not because they're exempt from its vote, but because if he's not allowed to bring his dog, then he is, it's just impossible for him to go. Yeah, but one thing is the, the COVID situation is a communal environmental problem. Right. The blind situation is a personal one that he can overcome with his dog. Right. And so, and, but, uh, but what seems to be is that Rabbi Feinstein is saying that that shot that talk to that person is something that we all have to be concerned about. Yeah. Right. The dog becomes the main problem. Or can you all that? Well, the, the, the blind person coming to Shul is a communal bed. Yeah, it's not a communal bed. The dog itself is not a communal. No, no, no. Right. Right. no, it facilitates more people. It, it exactly. facilitates inclusion. Well, yeah, Lori. It facilitates more people coming, but you know, there's an actual evidence of like a mitzvah and a shawl or say, I don't know, a barrel will allow somebody to come. Right. Now, I would also add somebody who rarely passes by a dog without petting them. Right. The one dog. That's true. <laughs> that, you know, I won't touch. Right. So I think that's something that we can appreciate. Hopefully all of us do. That's something that Rabbi Bryce could not even imagine. Right. And that's that, that I think going back to what Cindy said, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. So I also have two thoughts. So uh, one is, when you're talking about the 
have to be visual. But you know, 60, 80, 70 years ago, schools were struggling to get an agent. So when something could be the 10th, could right? be right. So, that's one part. Right. Also related to all this. You could free your slave to get a check. No, <laughs> private so, so it's one thing, you know, to bring. I mean, now that you know, 10 million and other, you know, common place. So, maybe, you know, if somebody brought in a, a service dog into a, a 10 million, right. Right, the, uh, right. So there, there, there doesn't seem to be a, the, the concern doesn't seem to be a diminishment of the tzibur if you read carefully if you want to parse the words it's a it's a detriment to mikdash ma'at. So you, you know a backyard minion doesn't have sanctity as a, the edifice doesn't only when it's used in that only when it's used in that for those purposes. When you're having a minion, then the minion the people create something, right? But that's different than that room. Nobody's in it. And it does maintain a it maintains a, a, a modicum of uh, of kedusha. Yeah. Also, is there a leniency when something that might not necessarily be kosher but seems to be uh, medication or a cure for somebody, and that this dog is you know easing their blindness? Right. So that I can understand that as in terms of Shabbos issues. In other words, there's concern like um, you know, can you pick up a dog? Can you certain things like that? Dogs might be muksa. And so we would say that a service animal, that wouldn't apply. But I'm not sure, again, when you think about it as shared space, then there's an argument to be, again, there's, there's an argument to be made that our shared spaces should be as inclusive as possible. And the counter argument would be, our shared spaces need to maintain a level of, of, of decorum such that everyone is able to concentrate. And the difference between the two may be cultural, may be geographical, but I think that's where that's where the rubber hits the road. And it may very well be that therein lies the difference between a rabbi Feinstein and a rabbi Reich. Yeah, one more? Yeah, one more. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So that 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 that's why it's um by the way, one of the other things that Rabbi Reich says is he, he, he argues with Rabbi Feinstein about his interpretation of that Gemara, that Yerushalmi. He holds that it's not talking about donkeys, it's talking about donkey drivers, it's talking about human beings, not animals. So there's some fundamental differences of opinion in terms of how you interpret that Talmud and also how you apply that in other, uh, in, 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 in other cases. But obviously, everyone would agree that, that, that an animal or anything that's going to be uh, disruptive or obviously contraindicated to sanctity of the synagogue would be off limits. The question is, um, is that is that across the is, is that a category? Is that categorical? Meaning, are animals categorically banned from 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 a synagogue, or does it very much depend on the animal and the circumstance and the and the, and the community and the expectations and the um, and, and 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 the expectations of of, of everyone else uh, present. Okay, thank you very much. Hope you, hope you learned something. And uh, we'll meet again next week. Have a good night.